Good evening, and thank you for tuning in to Gay TV. My name is Gay Lee, and I'm your host. This is the first in a series of discussions about the disenfranchisement, the apathy, and the, the disappointment, and the lack of trust uh, the black community has been experiencing in its local leaders. I'm here today with Dr. and Mr. Muhid, Fatima and Onaja Muhid. Um, and I want to thank you for, for coming out. Uh, I, this is our healing conversation. This is the first in a series of what, what we're going to do. We're going to talk about how to heal, how to help. Our people are hurting. And it's one thing to offer counseling and people who come from different cultures, but it's a whole other thing when you get it right at your core as to why black, blacks are having so many problems and why black children are suffering so much. Mm -hmm. So um, let's talk about that. I know you've done some work in Chester, you've done some work in Philadelphia and in New Jersey. So let, let's talk about that. What, what do you think? Dr. Afis. So you, you are deferring to me. I am deferring to you. Yeah. So, uh, you know, Gay, I am very happy that this conversation is beginning. I mean, it's been a conversation that's been happening over the past, um, I guess, 10 years or so about the dynamic of um, violence and what's happening inside of the black community. And so I'm happy that you brought this to the front in terms of a healing conversation and what that means. And um, we recognize that um, violence is not just a result of uh, the guns. It's not just a result of um, people um, speaking uh, or uh, with the, one another in ways that um, foster um, the apathy that you talk about. Um, I think that what we are here to just talk about is the relatedness between the relationship between violence and trauma and how trauma creates uh, the kind of spaces that won't allow people to engage in a democracy in the ways in which we frame or we think democracy should exist. Uh, so uh, with that, you know, uh, we're here to respond to your questions and to just kind of give insight to our work and what we've been doing over the past um, 10 years in this area of human services and violence and trauma and why it's necessary to have a healing conversation. The question is uh, quite profound because it really elicits so many answers from so many di directions. I probably would say that Mari Evans, uh, a writer <coughs> that I haven't been in touch with her in a number of years, but she wrote an article maybe in about 1973 the name of the article was Creativity and its Relationship to Colonialism, something like that. Maybe I don't have the title exactly right, but what I remember about the article is that she said, if you can make a people mystified, dependent, subordinate, and powerless, that you actually have colonize that group, that people. And I'll weigh that with what Dr. Martin Luther King said. He said that black ghettos are no more than domestic colonies. Mm -hmm. Not Malcolm X, King. So the first place, the first thing to do is place it in context. And the context we're talking about is oppression and the context we're talking about is domestic colonialism. And once you approach it from that point of view, you would have to automatically ask the question of 
what is the history of this people, uh, what is their state right now, their status right now, and, their, and what is the future. Another way of saying that is if a people don't know their identity, mm -hmm. they don't know their past, they don't know their identity, if they don't know and have a sense any political power in terms of what they can do for themselves right now, they're really empty. And if they don't have a direction, a future for themselves, they don't have any direction. So we're really talking about some very basic fundamental questions about identity, purpose, and direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. and can I just add a little bit to that? Um, when we talk about the future and we uh, go into a community where uh, many young people don't feel they have a future, uh, we can't get to the possibility of what a future could be until we deal with the pain, the suffering, the hurt from the past and what's in the present. And so that is a really good point, you know, in relationship to, um, you know, people who don't have a sense of their history and identity and what brought us to the state that we're in now, that there is very little room for people to conceptualize what a future might be. Do you think the black culture has been watered down at all? Mm -hmm. uh, I think I'll ask Onaji to answer that because well, we talk about induced culture. Yeah. yeah. Um, I have looked at this concept of like what's authentic mm -hmm. and what's manufactured or what is induced from a particular situation. So the culture that most black people are living today one, they didn't originate it. It came from someplace else. The value systems, the belief systems, the worldview came from those who kidnapped us, which is which is a crime against humanity, and engaged in you know three hundred years of oppression. So the culture we have is really an induced survival culture. Um, and in the way that you know the difference between an authentic culture. And an induced culture is that authentic culture is very much like the mother. It's going to be um, love, it's going to be affection, it's going to be protection, and it's going to be challenge to grow. So if you see a people not acting out of those values, you know that they're in fact not living out of an authentic culture. They're living out of an induced culture. And, and, and what's made it worse is that Black people have come to think that which they're living is truly their culture, which is no more than really a slave culture. And until we go back and really distinguish that through the history, people will remain confused, and in their confusion, they'll continue to uh, engage in high levels of, uh, of fratricide. So, yeah, we have a problem in terms of black police officers, white police officers killing our children. Yes, we have a problem. But that's no less than the problem we have of, of black teenagers shooting each other. But it's connected. All, so, you, so you talk about racism from an external point of view, and you talk about racism from an internal point of view. So all of it is connected to the, the system of institutionalized racism. Yeah. And also I want to just point out that when we talk about the uh, oppression, you know, enslavement was, and the particular enslavement in this country was probably the epitome of a type of oppression against humanity that wasn't experienced anywhere else in the world. And so we have a particular um, reality that must be addressed. And when we talk about healing, we have to go back and uh, deconstruct or take apart uh, the uh, experience so that we can actually see the experience. And we, I think, in a community <coughs> need to do that mm -hmm. for ourselves because uh, we can't expect those who colonize us to actually unpack that and to give us the therapy we didn't get. And Joy Leary talks of Joy DeGru talks about this in terms of, do you ever know, did we ever get any therapy, you know, after enslavement and that were violent acts and that was mm -hmm. seriously um, trauma mm -hmm. and so, uh, the notion of oppression and what Elnaji alluded to with the notion of internalized oppression uh, and externalized oppression, that those things work in tandem. Mm -hmm. I always think in terms of, I, I'm a social worker, so I tend to think like a social worker. And I look at 
the behaviors, and these behaviors are in place for a reason. You said, you're right, they are induced. And, and they, they're, they're met to help people to survive in certain situations. But I o often think that education is the key to climbing out of the barrel. Education, knowing your rights, um, and constantly, even though you fall, trying to stand up to, to demand those rights. What happens when we look in a city like Newburgh, like parts of New York City, Philadelphia, any, any city? What, what goes through your mind when you look around and you see the disappointment on people's face? Um, I know that they, I, I tend to think that it's just hard for them to climb out of their, their situation, but I also look and I see this force pushing them back down. And it's not just bringing people back into the barrel. It's almost like it's a whole political structure set in place to keep poverty the biggest business in town. Um, and, and it impacts the black community, in my mind, more than any other community because we, we tend to, to buy into it. It's that induced um, survival skill that, that you talked about because it, as hard as as difficult as it is to be at the to be at the bottom climbing out of it and getting to the place that we're at is you know it, it, it raises glaring concerns for me sometimes I just want to go back there because it's easier and the expectations are not as great when I'm here but at this place I'm expected to bring someone to bring someone up with me, and bringing them out of it is hard because they see the pain on us, the difficulty that we're having, the troubles that we have, um, breaking the 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 very low glass ceiling, and so in my mind sometimes it makes it hard for them to come out, to to get through that, and they feel very comfort comfortable in their, staying in their place. Yeah, I, when you say education, um, I think Carter G. Watson put it uh, most appropriately when he said that there's the miseducation of the quote Negro, and that the system is not just the system of poverty, it's all of these systems that work together mm -hmm. to ensure that the hierarchical structure of this society stays in place. And so, yes, education, but what kind of education? Right. What is the nature of the education that uh, people get? And particularly people who are economically uh, disadvantaged. Uh, so when we talk about education, uh, it's, you know, the education inside <coughs> of institutions are part of the system that's not just the education system, but it's the criminal justice system, it's the political system, it's the economic system, it's all those systems intertwined. And so the way that education has been structured is that you are educated in one small area. And even that education, if you look at black education, you know, uh, right after enslavement, there was this push for education for liberation. It wasn't the education so that I can make a million dollars or so that I can be a part of a society that really don't want me to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. And so we have to start to rethink what we mean by education for a community that is oppressed from the outside and also that has internalized mm -hmm. uh, oppression. And that, uh, you know, I think, I think that um, I, I just want to say we could do an entire segment on the nature of education in America for black people. And what needs to shift, you know? So the, um, that's you know one of the um, thoughts I have in relationship to this notion of education and not being able to move to move up or to uh, expand our capacity for healing and for uh, understanding who we are as a people. And Go, going going back to Mari Evans, so if, if she says that mystification is the first rung in the ladder of control and dominance and, and colonialism, 
then of course the antithesis of that would be education. Mm -hmm. and, and it goes to the point of what kind of education. Uh, but the second part is self-reliance. So if education is not tied to self-reliance, where mm -hmm. people are controlling their own economy, um, then, then they're still going to be beholden to uh, external power. Again, King said that we live in domestic colonies. And what is a colony? A colony is where a group of disenfranchised people live. Uh, inferior products are put in, right, where they can dump into the black community inferior products, and then they can extract out what? Labor. Mm -hmm. So people are poor in any way they can. So um, the labor is extracted, uh, inferior goods are put in, and it's a continuous cycle where someone outside, and of course they're not controlling the politics of their community. Right. Right. So if you're not able as a people to get from the education level to the self-reliance level, you stay in the bind. Uh, we haven't had the leadership to make that step. We have been somewhat successful in, in the last 20 years of realizing that African people are the first people on the planet. We, some of us know that, and certainly a great many of us still don't know that. But I'm saying more of us know it today than, than we did, well, let's say, 30 years ago. So, so we've made some inroads with the uh, writings of Dr. Ben, writings of Dr. Clark, uh, Mari Evans, and, and many others, uh, Amos Wilson, people like that who've been educating us. But we haven't been able to translate that into economy. And the reason we haven't been able to translate it is the question of trust. You, talk, you brought that up. Trust is at the heart and soul of our problem at this point because we have for centuries been taught to distrust each other. Now remember, you can go back to Rosewood. You can go back to uh, the Black Wall Street in, uh, Oklahoma. in Oklahoma. There were many small towns where, given the chance to be educated and self-reliant, we were. We had that. But we have to also understand there was always the right response was saying that you don't deserve to have anything more than what I have. Oh, what I so, give you. Right. So what I give the you. first bombing in America was in Black Wall Street in Oklahoma, right? Mm -hmm. You can look at Rosewood. I remember seeing uh, a show on um, Charlie Rose, and he was interviewing uh, the uh, director of uh, Rosewood. And one of the questions was, were there other uh, Rosewoods? Or he, he was talking about Rosewood, but the, lo the next logical question would be, well, are there other Rosewoods? But he never, Charlie Rose never asked the question. So we don't really know the complexity and depth and the magnitude of, of, of how the white community responded to positive, progressive black communities when we did, in fact, make that jump. So it's not about an inability in and of ourselves. It's been this constant, like you said, external pressure from the external community that has really created a state of what is called learned helplessness. Learned, I appreciate that. Yeah, learned helplessness because what you said is uh, what happens when we are knocked down, you know, what what is it that motivates us to keep getting back keep up? Getting back to keep up. getting back up. Yeah. And I think our people uh, prior to, say, the... Um, the 70s or the 80s, we kept getting back up. Right. We kept getting back up. Yeah. Still I rise. Still I rise, yes, yes. And the um, the notion that the morphing of capital, and, and we haven't even mentioned this notion of capitalism and its impact and, um, you know, the ways in which technology and um, uh, the, the morphing of these uh, external pressures. So, now it's just not black people who are enslaved. It's like all people who are consumers become enslaved, you know, but in the context of what we need to do with regards to, to healing. And it's just not, uh, you know, we are focused on um, the black community in terms of the healing, but the world needs healing. And yeah, if this violence is uh, really uh, diminishing of humanity, and so it's you know it's more than um, more than just what can we do alone, but what do we do? What can we do as a collective? Uh, you know, and then moving towards you know what do we do as a human species? When I thought about doing this segment, I 
it was the, the backdrop is all of these young black men being killed. But there, there, there is a dual dynamic here. We have, in this city, we have young whites, ex young white men experiencing the same kinds of problems, similar kinds of problems. They're not being beat. But the, 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 what's disturbing is the identification. You have these, these the, the reason I focused on blacks is because if you fix those problems, we'll fix the problems of other people. Because in order to be part of this subculture, of the black subculture, you have to be like the black sub subculture. So you have young white guys acting and behaving as like young poor blacks do. So if, they, if, if I, I'm white and society says I can get more and I can do more, but since I can't, I might as well identify with this group, but I have to act like this group. So if we fix this group, then we're going to inadvertently fix the other groups. Mm -hmm. I, I see that as so important. There are programs throughout the United States that help poor white families, that help poor Latino families, but no program offers specific help to blacks. Well, I'd like to uh, introduce project that uh, Dr. Hafiz uh, worked on in Chester. He had mentioned Chester. And the question becomes, okay, once you know all this, what we've talked about in the last 15 or 20 minutes, so the question is, what's next? What do you do? Next? Well, um, Dr. Hafiz has uh, pioneered a process that she calls community conversations for change. For change. Mm -hmm. uh, in Chester, uh, the group that was working together uh, named the project uh, Real Change. So I would ask her to talk about the project and, and the success of that project. Mm -hmm. yeah. Could I just ask you if this is a, was a project that specifically worked with blacks? Yes. Well, it, it was centered around um, it was centered around the uh, violence and uh, you know the circumstances and situations that happen in communities all over America inside of black communities where the economic conditions are uh, poor, where the education system is non-functional. And um, so it was centered around primarily black males uh, in this context because they got a lot of blame for the violence that was happening in the city. And um, he mentioned, oh, Najee mentioned that uh, real change, real change was the, uh, was the title that the community gave to the process. And so uh, this process actually began uh, with work that Onaji and I both had done in this small city in 2008. Uh, we, uh, I was invited in with some colleagues to uh, look at social capital in the city. They had already gone in and looked, wanted to look at what, what does social capital look like. And social capital means the networks that happen and how people actually move about inside of um, communities or spaces and help you get, ac get access to resources and so forth. So this project, they, uh, the two colleagues, uh, political scientists and educator, uh, asked me, and I'm an educator, uh, and um, when I just am a social, social, social worker too, <laughs> which uh, may be very true, but um, they wanted to look at social capital. So they asked if I would mind coming in on this project with them. And when I recognized how they were actually going into the community, I decided, well, I don't think I can do that. Because when universities go into our community, they go in, they research, they bring out information, and they leave the community in the same way that they, they came into the community. But they go back and make their careers and make their, you know, imprint with the data that they've collected off the backs of the people in those communities. So I suggested, well, no, I can't do that. But what I can do is make a proposal. If you go back to the people who brought you in and say to them, uh, can we do dialogue? Can we create conversations at the ground level with the people on the ground, with the community? Let's look at what their 
social capitalists. Let's look at what their networks are in terms of how they generate connection and relationships. And what does that mean in the context of addressing the issues that you think are so prevalent in the community? And so they took their proposal back to the people who had brought them in and they said, yeah, that's exactly what we wanted to do. And so from that point, Onaje and I went in and we created these conversations and we produced some data that told us what people were feeling, what they were thinking, and how they were perceiving their reality. Mm -hmm. And so our goal was to get that information and then take that information back to the community and say, is this what you said? You know, we don't want to give this information out there and, and um, this is not what you said. And so we wanted to do that, but for what many a myriad of reasons, that after we completed our report, it didn't get back to the community. And I think that one of the things we want to say is that the way that, uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about this in terms of how the children and what, because this, what, when we went in, this was sort of the generative, uh, the, gener the, the, um, the generative catalyst for the second part of the project that I'll talk about. But um, maybe you could talk about how we went in with the, the yeah, we went meetings. In with, we, we went in with a question. Yeah. Uh, the question was, how are the children? Mm -hmm. We wanted to know from the community, how are the children from their point of view? And it was parents of the community, grandparents, uncles and aunts, uh, social parents. And we would meet like once a week and have them come in and just have this dialogue. Uh, and then we coupled that question. We coupled that question with um, greetings from Africa. Uh, in South Africa, when they meet, they say, uh, "I see you," mm -hmm. you know. And it's a it's a back and forth thing. Uh, that's the short version of it. Uh, in uh, the Dogon, when they meet each other, they say, uh, "God sent you. How is your health?" Mm -hmm. And the last question, they, the Messiah we use as greetings is how are the children? So we use those questions, those greetings, as a philosophical uh, stamp um, of, of what's behind uh, African people's thinking mm -hmm. and to bring us back into a certain kind of way of talking to each other. Mm -hmm. And it was very, very successful. And even though we didn't really have a chance to discuss the report that came out of that, Later on, I'm going to fast forward to real change, those same uh, important points came up again. Yeah. So, so it was yeah. consistent. So I'm going to fast forward from 2008 and jump to what, 2000? 2011. 11, yeah. And we'll talk about the shooting. Yeah, so um, I, I want to go back and just say that um, copying is probably the, the greatest form of flattery. So after we did the 2008 piece, How the Children. How the children we came back and we saw that the whole district was using this how are the children. And they, so, they added another sentence to it, how are the children, something, something they added to it, but we knew where it came we from. We knew where it came from, right? So that, that, was, that was real flattery because it meant that something resonated there, you know, right. and right. we are always looking for resonance. Mm -hmm. And so fast forward to 2011, and in 2011, there was a shooting. There was a shooting at a birthday party where nine young people got shot. And two of those young people expired. Now, these two young people that died were friends with many other people. So when this happened, the whole community became parallel. Now, this is not the first shooting that had, uh, happened where young people had gotten shot. Young people getting shot in Chester just as quickly as they were getting shot in Chicago and in Philadelphia and probably New York City. And so um, when this happened, the young people were taken to the hospital, to the emergency room. I mean, it was, uh, and our, our dear friend Lisa would say, they said it was pandemonium, it was chaos. And so they get to the hospital, and the hospital staff couldn't really deal with the whole community just being there and not knowing what to do with the community. And they ended up closing the emergency room. So people couldn't get in to see their children. And they called the president to, of the hospital to come and um, witness. So he came to the emergency room. And when he looked out uh, upon the people, he says, 
how can I, a white guy, go out there and tell them that things are going to be okay? Because he says that we don't know and we don't have the answers for this. But in the meantime, while he was in the uh, emergency room, he saw a young man come out of the room where one of the young person had just expired, and it was a family member. And he saw the young man banging his head on the wall and hitting the wall, and he asked himself, what would I do if that was my son? Because the mother who was there with the child, and the child's banging his head, young teenage, banging his head and beating the wall, the mother just says, come on, boy, come on. You know, get, that, that's done, let's get out of here. And he couldn't believe that's what he heard. He says, what would I have done if it was my child? I would have tried to nurture him. I would have tried to hold him. And um, what he didn't realize, which I brought to the table when he started to express this, is that because the mother didn't know how to deal with that. The mother is traumatized too. The whole community now is traumatized. And this is just not the parents who uh, lost children or whose children have been maimed and injured, but it's the entire community. Mm -hmm. And so he recognized that the top don't have information. They don't have enough information. They don't have the, they don't know what to do. The bottom don't know what to do. But if we bring the top down and the bottom up, we might be able to find answers to what's happening. So once he recognized that, he called the woman who we were working with, Janet Bailey Ford, who was oh. working with, with youth in the city. Mm -hmm. She was with the uh, Chester Youth Collaborative, doing a lot of phenomenal work with young people. And he called her, he says, Janet, you know, because this uh, <coughs> collaborative was under the hospital aus uh, auspices. And so he says, we don't know what to do, we need to do something. And that's when she called us in to come in and see what we can do. And then there's a whole backdrop story to that in terms of how we came in, mm -hmm. what we did. And so that's that's another piece of that. But, so, yeah. so we had four cohorts. We had administrators like this. Uh, city, city council people. Uh, uh, we had the president of the hospital. Chief, chief of police yes. representative. Yeah, yeah. Uh, at different times, the superintendent. Of education. Of education department. So the management of the city was part of one cohort. Right. The second cohort were the professionals. Uh, could have mm -hmm. been social workers, could have been teachers, uh, could have been counselors. And then Probation the officers, mm -hmm. nurses, police officers. And the third cohort uh, was the community itself. We Residents. would actually go out mm -hmm. in the community and have workshops there. And the fourth were the youth. Mm -hmm. All these cohorts met separately. Parallel, Most so of the parallel, time, yes. but at different times, we, I think we had two summits. Mm -hmm. We brought everybody together, and from that, um, using a social um, psychology approach, mm -hmm. uh, looking at uh, the work of uh, Charles Rosman mm -hmm. from France that Fatou has been studying for about 15 years now. Yeah, yeah, since 2000. Mm -hmm. So she used the approach of getting to the hurt, getting to the harm, getting to the suffering, mm -hmm. uh, which is like four types of suffering, abandonment. Mm -hmm. uh, being afraid of aggression, mm -hmm. uh, the unknown, meaning not having meaning, mm -hmm. and um, yes. So we can't think of the four of them right now. Right. Okay. <laughs> no, I, I saw the time and it was like, okay, yeah. so we are at, so, yeah. Let, let me just kind of recap, because a couple of things, we've talked about the history where things have come from, how it got to this place. Because our discussion is healing conversations, identifying the problems, and at the core, the, the backdrop, is the amount of pain and suffering people are feeling, and it's so much so they don't know what to do with it. Yes. So I'm hoping that in our next conversation, because I think we should follow this up, you just, the two of you are just full of information, I'm being told, Speed it up, speed it up. <laughs> Thank you for yeah. coming on. My name is Gay Lee, and you have been watching Gay Lee TV. Thank you.